Today, I am going to talk about the first slogan in the seven points of mind training from the book Lo Jong by Traleg Rinpoche. The first slogan is first train in the preliminaries. So the Lo Jong practice consists of very concise slogans that ideally you would memorize them. And as you go through your day, they come to your mind in reference to a particular situation that you are in or that you're thinking about doing. There's a total of 59 slogans. And with the preliminaries, this includes what are called the four ordinary foundations or the four thoughts that turn one's mind to the Dharma. And that really says a lot right there that these four contemplations are intended to get our minds more focused on Dharma practice and less focused on our mundane lives. It's very easy to get caught up in our mundane lives and not have time to practice. So these four thoughts help us get a little perspective on our situation, a perspective with some wisdom so that we can make the best use of our situation and get the most benefit from it. In a way, you could say that life is short. Death is unpredictable. Why squander life? Instead of focusing on our difficulties, our dissatisfaction, and looking externally for happiness, by contemplating these four thoughts, you resolve to make the most of this opportunity that you have in our present lifetime. So this is a very, very important point. Pralik Rinpoche says that we need to resolve to make the most of our opportunities in life. And he says to keep this thought permanently in mind. Quote, I have wasted enough time. Why waste any more? From now on, I'll do something constructive and beneficial with my life instead of squandering it in meaningless activity. It's easy to give lip service to that, but it's much more difficult to actually, you might say, take it to heart, to understand it at a very deep level and use it as a guiding idea or principle in our daily lives. The four thoughts, the way they are phrased here in Traleg Rinpoche's book are precious human body, impermanence, the dissatisfactory nature of samsara, and karma as cause and effect. He goes through each of these. So I'm going to start with precious human body. Our body is precious because we can't practice without a body. It's necessary for enlightenment. On the other end, we tend to take our body for granted. We fail to appreciate it. And sometimes we engage in risky behavior. And there's lots of different kinds of risky behavior. It can be as simple as me getting up on a ladder at my age. That's risky behavior. It could be speeding. It could be smoking, driving after drinking, and on and on. There are just so many different kinds of behavior that the long-run effect is that they shorten our lifespan or reduce the quality of our life and so on and so forth. So instead of looking at uh, short-term pleasures and gains and so forth, it's important to take a long-term look at our behavior and what our goals are. It is so easy these days in this digital age to get caught up in mundane, trivial concerns that we have to keep reminding ourselves of what is important and what is not important. What came to my mind in terms of taking a look and seeing what is important and what isn't, I think most of you have heard me say this before. I ate at Carme Ling with Kempo Karta Rinpoche one time and got a fortune cookie, which read to see your drama is to be liberated from it. 
So a lot of times as we can look within closely with fresh eyes that aren't caught up in the mundane, trivial affairs that we are in, we start seeing that there's a lot of drama. It's unnecessary. And we can drop it or liberate ourselves from it just by seeing that. And what happens is we get caught up in these things, first of all, because it's a habit. And then we think that, well, if I change my circumstances, then the drama will be over with. And you change your circumstances. And it's a different version of the same drama. Here's an experience that I was thinking about last night, and that was my marriage. And I got to the point where I just did not like the relationship that I was in. And I blamed my former wife for the problem in the relationship. Then we went to marriage counselor and yada, yada, yada. And eventually the marriage broke up. Very quickly, I got in a relationship with a totally different woman, very different from my former wife. Hadn't known her for very long. And within two months, I was in the same place with her as I was with my former wife. Then the light bulb went off. It's me. It's not her. And I never asked a woman out after that. I realized that I had some homework to do. This is really an important point that I'm stressing here. We have to look at ourselves clearly and see that there's a lot of things we get involved with that we don't have to get involved in as deeply as we are. And to see our habitual patterns and realize that it's just habitual patterns and we can change. Trolleg Rinpoche in the book, he talks about getting obsessed about weight gain, wrinkles, and things like that. But you can also obsess about your co-workers, your partner, kids, your clothes, cleaning house, and on and on and on. It's an endless amount of things that we can get caught up with that really aren't all that important. So we need to use this very precious opportunity for spiritual practice, at least the best that we can because it can be gone in an instant. And even if you don't die, you can be disabled to the point where you really can't practice. And you might want to practice, but for whatever reason, you can't. So here is a quote that is in the book by Milarepa. Oh, you confused and worldly beings, you always waste your leisure, letting time slip by. Though your mind is ever saying, I must practice the Dharma, your life is wasted as the hours slip by. The standard metaphor for this is a person going to an island that is full of jewels. The beach is just covered with jewels. You go inland and jewels are just strewn all over the ground, valuable jewels. And the man or the woman, the person, enjoys themselves while they are there, and then they leave the island and return home, and when they get home, they realize, I didn't take any jewels with me. So we have to be careful that we don't overlook the important things and that we avoid realizing how precious our human life is at the time that it's too late to take advantage of it. So the standard contemplation includes looking at how many animals there are in the world compared to human beings. Now, where I live, I've got a lot of rocks on the ground. This time of year, if I take a rock that's laying on the ground and move it underneath it is an ant colony. Thousands and thousands of ants under just one rock. If you start going around to different rocks, probably millions and millions of ants on my land. Sometimes they like to come into the house too. The point being, there's a huge amount of animals in the environment and humans are a very, very small 
percentage of the animal population, especially when you get down to animals that are very, very hard to see unless you have a microscope or at least a magnifying glass. So it is very rare for an, a being to be born a human as opposed to the animal realm. And Prolog Rinpoche didn't go into the other four realms, the hell realm, the hungry ghost realm, the jealous god realm, and the full god realm. But in a way, you don't even have to do that. Just compare animals to humans. And the Buddha used this example of a blind sea turtle that's swimming around in the, the vast ocean, and there's an ox yoke floating on the surface. And every hundred years, the turtle surfaces, and the chance of that sea turtle sticking its head through that ox yoke are greater than it is for an animal to be born a human. To help give you an idea of how rare it is to take a human birth. So we need to appreciate our human body and appreciate that it has unlimited spiritual potential. Having a human body means that it has all kinds of attributes and what are defined as leisure, and I'm going to be mentioning those here in a minute. And it's free of impediments that keep us from practicing the Dharma and traveling the path. So they talk about free of impediments, having certain endowments, and so forth. So the impediments are with a human body, but it's still not a precious human body because you have birth in an environment where there is abject poverty and there is no chance to practice. The second uh, impediment is where uh, food is scarce and famine common. A third is a place where there's constant warfare. A fourth is a place where people have very short lives. And there are places like this right now on the earth. And then the fifth one is having serious physical or mental deficiencies. So to sum up the problem with these is that your life will be full of a lot of suffering, have little opportunity to practice, and little chance of pursuing a spiritual path. The freedoms that we possess as human beings are, first of all, we have a human body. We do have leisure enough to pursue spiritual practice. The very fact that you're on the Zoom meeting indicates that. You have physical health and intelligence. And I am going to add to that, this is Kralag Rinpoche's words, that you have enough physical health to practice. The next one is you have contact with the teachings. You have moral sensibilities to appreciate the teachings. You feel compassion for others. These are what are considered freedoms that precious human birth possesses. It makes human birth special and precious. So our human body has all the capacities that we need to cultivate spirituality. Many humans lack these things, and it's good to remind yourself of these freedoms and endowments and appreciate them. I had a meeting with inmates earlier today and I was asked, how can we be happy? And I said, think about things that you have, develop appreciation, and then gratitude. So if we can appreciate these things that we have, and then develop gratitude, and then follow up on that, you are going the right direction. Now, you might say the downside of precious human birth is the next one, which is impermanence, that we really don't know how long we will have this body in a way that we can utilize it. The standard phrase is the precious human body that's so hard to obtain and so easily lost. We're not invincible, therefore we need to prioritize our activities so that we don't waste time with unimportant activities. Very simply, 
it is that life is too precious to squander. We have to avoid a fatalistic approach, on the other hand, which would be, well, I'm going to die. I have no control of it. There's nothing that can be done, so I'm not even going to try. That is a dead-end approach, pardon my pun. The idea is to have a certain sense of urgency, not stressed out urgency, but having this feeling that I have to work on this now rather than put it off. When that sense of urgency develops, that's a sign that these contemplations are working because that's what they're trying to do is to develop this deep inside so that you feel it really in your heart. It becomes part of you. You want to avoid the idea of putting off practice and keep thinking, well, I'll do a retreat and then I will do this practice intensively and get a lot accomplished. And then you go on with your life and then you die. So we have to reflect on what is worth pursuing and what needs to be eliminated from our lives so that it becomes more workable and we're able to actually spend time practicing. Kralag Rinpoche talks about samsara being ephemeral, that there's a certain insecurity about it. There's possibilities and probabilities but there's really no sense of comfort or security. If you want to find real refuge, security, and comfort, then you take refuge in the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And unless we do that, and unless we then spend more time practicing, then we will continue experiencing more of the same old, same old rather than reducing our suffering and increasing our level of comfort. It's unrealistic to expect our present opportunities to go on forever. The seven points of mind training, they talk about thinking about people that have died before you. It might even be good to write down a list. And when you think of someone else that isn't on your list, put them on the list too. I have been writing a little bit about my life and the most recent writings had to do with a my friend that was killed in Menominee by being run over by a road grader. Two years after that, my grandmother died and I was the last one to be with her. And then two years after that, I went out to KTD to take Bodhisattva vows with Rinpoche. This was 1989. And when I got there, the office gave me a phone number and said they want you to call them, and I did, and a close friend of mine was killed. He had helped me put the roof up on my uh, what is now the center building, and then three months after that, there was a family that had driven down to, I think, Honduras or El Salvador to work with the indigenous population, helping them use more modern farming methods. And the group that was sponsoring him after he and his family went down there, they bought an old school bus, got it, filled it full of supplies and had another man drive it down there. And after he got there a few months or so, he got on a plane to fly home and the plane exploded in the air over to Gusagalpia. There was speculation it was a terrorist bomb because there was a government official in the plane. These were relatively young men in their 30s and early 40s. And then when I went into was prepared for the three-year retreat, I made a will out for the first time. And I chose a friend of mine that they'd done a lot of Dharma activity with for the executor. Two years into the retreat, I got word that he died of Lou Gehrig's disease. It's good to think about these things, to reflect on them. It sounds morbid, perhaps, but the more you think about this, the more you realize how fortunate we are that we are alive. So besides thinking about how fragile our body is, also think about how change is happening all the time. 
You know, all you have to do is observe the weather, for instance. It's very different in December up here than it is right now. I think our cars are very good examples of impermanence, that they need maintenance, they need oil changes, you need new tires. They need a lot less maintenance than they did when I was a young man, but they still need work on them. Then there's always the chance of running into a deer, the deer running into you. I joke about home ownership because of impermanence. Maintenance on the house is permanent. If you just look at these things, there's constant change. Here is one of my favorites, too, is your checking account. Mine is pretty impermanent. If I don't keep putting money in, it's, it's gone. And then the banker doesn't like me. They charge me. Anyway, he talks about geologic change. And here is a little tidbit. The bedrock here in Wisconsin and Minnesota, it depends on where you are, but it's limestone and sandstone, which only form underwater. And the geologists say that there was a vast inland sea that covered this area millions of years ago. Then, of course, the ground lifted up and it became a land instead of an inland sea. Where I live, there are a lot of rocks on top of the bedrock, which have nothing to do with limestone or sandstone. And they probably came from the hole that is now Lake Superior that the glacier dug and pushed it on my land. So things change. They're constantly changing. We might not realize this, but it's constantly changing. The point is to practice, follow through by continuing to practice and realize because of change and impermanence, you can change. We've got that going for us, impermanence. Finally, here is a quote that Trollig wants us to remember. He says, quote, even if mountains are subject to change and dissolution, how much more so is my own body, which is susceptible to disease, breakdown, the elements, accidents, and all kinds of harm. I must utilize my opportunities now before that chance is lost forever. The third thought is the dissatisfactory nature of samsara. To put it simply, we never really find any real meaning or purpose of worldly pursuits. He says, on the other hand, it's a mistake to think of life as just plain dissatisfactory by itself. It's just that we are, as confused samsaric beings, are not able to find satisfaction. We try to create safe, secure places, places that are comfortable, familiar, where we're in control, where we feel less vulnerable. The very best that we can do is deny impermanence and then maybe get mad or depressed when impermanence arises anyway and spoils things. We end up going around in circles. We may have different circumstances, but as I said earlier, emotionally, we're in the same place, making the same mistakes. There's a reason why on the wheel of life, it's circular, because samsara is cyclic existence. It's just circling, going over and over and over again. We have high expectations of samsara that really are unrealistic and can't be met. If we look closely, feelings of futility and even entrapment. And this kind of reflects the nature of conditioned existence, the nature of these disruptive circumstances that beyond our control and constantly changing and impermanent. The answer that we usually make is that, well, we just need more worldly achievements. We just need to work harder and then we'll get some meaning out of life. He quotes Milarepa and I'm gonna do that too. Whatever one does brings suffering and is futile. Whatever one thinks is impermanent and is futile. Whatever one achieves is illusory and futile. Even if one has it all, it is futile. The dharmas of samsara are futile.
trial of Grimbache goes on from there and says that our fulfillment of our temporary needs is quite different from our profound needs. We look for happiness, you might say, in the wrong places. If you're not happy before you get what you want, you won't be after you get what you want, at least not for long. It reminds me of uh, when my son was young. And I think this is a common experience for parents to have. We would put up a Christmas tree. There would be presents under the Christmas tree. And my son would get all excited seeing all these presents under the tree. Then he would go get a present of his and unwrap it, look at it, put it down, and then go get another present, unwrap it, look at it, put it down. And when all the presents were open, he would then turn to us and say, is that all? The point being, no matter how much you have, you're going to feel it's not enough. So we have to look kind of with wisdom and look beyond this. It's certainly fine to have a nice house and a nice car and so forth, but don't look at it as your source of happiness or a source of feeling protected. What frequently happens in samsara, in this world that you find there's a lot of dissatisfaction in, is you eventually get overwhelmed by it. I remember grandma when she was in her probably mid-80s, and she had a very interesting life, and she was a community leader, and she was a mortician. She had her own funeral home business. And now she is 85 or so. Her body is failing or her mind isn't as sharp as it was. And I would visit her and stay overnight with her in her apartment. And she would say sometimes to me, I hope I die in my sleep because she had enough. It can easily overwhelm people, all these things that we take so seriously and feel are so important, and then impermanence strikes, and it's just one hassle after another. Here's a new one that Tralek Rinpoche didn't mention that causes all kinds of stress. It's called fear of missing out. You have all these happy people having parties with other happy people on Facebook or other social media, and there you are looking at this on a screen by yourself. Even that can be stressful. So we have to kind of rein in our urge for distraction, entertainment. Frequently, the word addicted is used in terms of being addicted to the pleasures of samsara, very much like how you can become addicted to a drug, a painkiller, and so forth. Even though we are having what are supposed to be pleasant experiences, we don't really keep that joy and peace for very long. It it disappears quickly. He finishes up this chapter with this quote, most of my experiences are unpleasant because my mind is completely unruly and disturbed by conflicting emotions. Even when I imagine I'm having a good time, it's really only a disguised form of pain. As temporal goals can only satisfy temporary needs, I will devote myself from this day forward to spiritual practice. The last one is about karmic cause and effect. He starts out by saying that our karmic patterns are formed and sustained by intentional actions of body, speech, and mind. So everything that we do, say, or think, if there's a volitional intention, if there's motivation behind it, we're creating karma. We don't create karma by blinking our eyes or breathing. So our actions and our reactions are cause and the effect is that they lead to other actions and circumstances in the future. The common analogy is seed and fruit. These imprints are like a seed, and then the proper conditions are present. The seed sprouts, grows, and bears fruit. A virtuous action leads to happiness. Non-virtue leads to suffering. 
the Tibetans will say, if you plant barley, you harvest barley. And if you plant poisonous seeds, you harvest poisonous fruit. So it's important to know the difference between virtue and non-virtue, and then act on that knowledge. And when you are experiencing suffering and think that this is due to your actions, your attitudes, your thoughts, your emotions in the past, it's kind of a good way to remind yourself to pay more attention to what's going on in the present. To sum this last one up about karma is contemplate the truth of karma and use it as a guideline as you are going through your day and try to develop positive motivation and intentions. To sum up this section here, the reason why this is presented first is that this really is a foundation of traveling on the path. If you don't have this there at the beginning, then you're going to have doubt, hesitation, your commitment will be weak, and you'll give up. I remember being at KTD, this was before the pandemic. I'm not sure how many years before the pandemic. It was a 10-day teaching, and it was common for me to teach one of the four foundations of Nundro. And I can't remember which of the four I was teaching, but there was a person that attended and had a text, and I had never seen the text before. And it was a KTD text. And I started Nundro in 1989. And it turned out that this woman got the uh, KTD Nundro text before that, and here she was still working on it. The good news was that she was still working on it. There's a saying that I heard pretty quickly when I started doing Nundro, and that is don't make a career out of it. Try to you know, use some speed. I think that's a good way to term it. Make a commitment and follow through with the commitment. Pralik Rinpoche talks about it being good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end. And this is a very common way to express various things in Tibetan Buddhism. The idea is in the beginning, these contemplations encourage us to commit to spiritual practice. While we are practicing, then it helps sustain our practice. We need diligence, exertion, vigor, and this will help us maintain that. And you all know that you can have times where you are just needing a little extra motivation. And it's good when you're feeling down, feeling lazy, and so forth, to go over these contemplations again to help you renew your enthusiasm and commitment. And in the end, these contemplations are an aid to our spiritual fulfillment, using Kralig Rinpoche's words here. So these are not about how bad the world is. It's, they're used to gain wisdom about the world and how to live a meaningful life. There are obstacles to practice that he talks about. First is attachment to the pleasures of this life. The antidote is precious human birth and impermanence. Contemplate those if you're finding attachment to pleasure is a problem for you. The freedom and opportunities of our human existence and the difficulties of obtaining it are especially important. So carry these contemplations into your daily life. Again, go over these things over and over again. You really never progress beyond these contemplations. It's not like, okay, I graduated from high school, now I'm in college, I can put high school behind me. You never get to that point with these contemplations. Karmapa talked about compassion turned inwards is renunciation of the causes of suffering. So it's good to practice some compassion towards yourself and renounce the causes of suffering and work on reducing your own suffering. The other obstacle is wanting relative happiness in this life and future lives. 
here you're not focused on the ultimate goal. You are more interested on just having more happiness. Antidote to this is to contemplate the karma and the suffering that pervades all of samsara. Finally, the result of these contemplations will show if there's a reduction in attachment to conventional happiness. And if you see more subtle attachments to samsara as you progress, it's really important here that when you see these more subtle attachments, instead of going, oh, darn, there I go again, I keep screwing up, I keep seeing all these negative characteristics and habits that I have, that gets you nowhere. What you want to do is be glad that you are seeing these difficulties, because now that you see them, you're able to work with them. If you don't know where you are, how can you get where you want to be? And that pretty much sums up what I want to talk about today.